So you can see here, just one of the cameras. I'd watch you here. I beat the fuck out of you. Plenty of people were abused in these places. Their souls remain here lingering. I know a lot of you have a connection in this uh so I do this on behalf of you all. I uh, was reading some accounts of uh, other people's orientations, and it came up that even rape survivors were made to admit that they were accountable for choosing to go through with a rape. For example, uh, someone stands up and says that they had been raped and that was their emotional baggage that they were carrying around and claim accountability to the facilitator and to the rest of the group uh, for being in the position of being alone with someone who could rape you. teens I was involved with the wrong crowd listening to the wrong music doing the wrong things during that time my father passed away unexpectedly and things just seemed to take a turn for the worse I was in an outpatient drug rehabilitation program and my drug levels or my urinary analysis levels were not going down from week to week resulting in a referral to an inpatient program my mom refused and took it upon herself to seek alternative rehabilitation programs it was her intentions to find the absolute best rehabilitation program to help her son and to get him on the right path, regardless of cost. This is the promotional video my mom came across, paired with the song because You Loved Me by Celine Dion. I could literally puke. Spoiler alert, but everything they claimed to my mother was a lie. I never once used a computer, no custom courses, no mastery-based curriculum focused on personal achievement, no science and computer labs, no learning labs, and the school wasn't even accredited. Here's a letter sent out by Jason Finlinson, the director. It reads, as you are aware, your son or daughter is currently enrolled as a student at the Academy at Ivy Ridge. Pursuant to an agreement entered into by the Academy and the Office of the Attorney General of the State of New York, I'm writing to inform you that 1. Ivy Ridge is not registered in any manner by the State of New York or the New York State Department of Education. 2. Ivy Ridge is not currently accredited by any academic accrediting organizations. And three, Ivy Ridge is not authorized by the New York State Department of Education to grant high school diplomas to its students. Thank you for your attention to this matter. Very truly yours, Jason Finlinson, Director. The way I'd like to describe a black hole is <clears throat> picture a lake of water. And on the lake, right in the very center, is a whirlpool. And even though you really can't see the whirlpool from the outside, it kind of slowly pulls you in to the center of the whirlpool and as you get closer it starts to go faster and faster as it spins around and pretty soon as you get too close to the edge it'll suck you in and you're gone now, obviously a black hole is a little bit more a bigger than a whirlpool but it kind of gives you an idea of how a black hole works now black holes are um, they're black because as they're condensed they're they're really dense in the middle and usually where you get a black hole is a star explodes and it's, a less, it's the leftover mass of the star. And the reason it's a uh, picture, uh, if the sun was a black hole, it would be the size of Cambridge University. It's just small. 
And so what happens is you have all this force, gravity pulling down things into it. And that's why they're black because it, uh, light can't escape because there's so much force pulling it into the black hole. How many black holes did you create, Jason? How many stars' lights did you put out? How many souls did you destroy with your black hole method? How many millions did you take from desperate parents? Teen Help is a free referral service for parents of struggling teens and can help direct parents to both short and long-term options to assist their family. Take a look at this guy right here. Mr. Paxton, ex-cop, raging, full of emotions, a love to see others suffer. Look at the smirk on his face as these five grown men escort this kid down to isolation and continue in their physical abuse. This is one of the strange men that picked me up in the middle of the night from my home back in 2002. My mother let them in and as they approached me in my room, they said their famous line, we can do this the easy way or we can do this the hard way. A little confused at the time, I answered and said the easy way, but later found out that the question was simply an illusion. Only the hard way existed. They proceeded by turning me around and placing me in handcuffs and escorting me out into their Jeep. It was then a three hour ride to Chicago where we had boarded a plane and continued to my final destination to Ogdensburg, New York, 735 miles away. shadows in the door and voices when they said that you could do it the easy way or the hard way you knew it was already a threat it was the worst nearly nine hours of my life how does one proceed when trying to unpack years of abuse how does one expose a multinational cabal of businesses that abuse children and get paid well for it how do you lay plain the trappings of a child cult. The language, the behaviors, the teachings, and the pain. How does one do these things in a way such that people will listen? Breaking Code Silence is a movement that aims to bring to light the abuse and corruption that runs rampant in the troubled teen industry. I arrived in New York and finally at the academy at Ivy Ridge, I was escorted into the front doors to find a few men waiting for me. As I walked in, I saw a man named Joseph Mitchell, and he said with a crooked smile, Welcome home. I'll never forget it. I looked around. The halls were empty. Complete silence. Nobody anywhere. You could literally hear a pin drop. My shoes were removed and I was escorted by three men, including Joseph, upstairs to take an inventory of the bag my mom had packed for me. Once the inventory was complete, they asked me to initial the inventory. I told them I ain't signing nothing. Instantly I was grabbed by the back of my neck and I was thrown down to the ground and my head driven into the tile floor. Another guy grabbed my arms and another my legs, twisting them as my head was smashed deeper into the tile. One of them drove his knee into my back while saying, you will sign it. At that point, I realized these guys didn't play by any rules. I was the 12th child on the boys' side to arrive at the Academy at Ivy Ridge. This was way back before the other buildings were even used. No cameras, no computer labs, no nothing. I was told that I was number 450 on campus. Uh, there were 250 girls and 200 boys at the time. Um, they take everything from you and strip you naked in a bare room. And they make you spread and cough and jump up and down and do jumping jacks in front of, again, adults while naked. Um, and you're treated to a cavity search, much like a prisoner. It's really hard to explain how this program works even though I see it so clearly. If you're familiar with breaking a horse, it would give you a better understanding. They start by breaking their spirit through physical exhaustion, 
followed by pain, fear, and intimidation. This program is really quite the reflection of how the bigger operating system works, but more on that later. Here's an example. We have a new student who is refusing to get his hair cut, similar to me when I refused to sign my inventory sheet. We have some upper level students, which didn't exist when I got there, more on that later, but they are trying to coach him into shaving off all his hair, and he is simply refusing. A man walks in, and if I'm not mistaken, this guy's name is George Tulip, and he was one of the absolute worst and he proceeds to grab the student and throw him to the ground. The upper level students are told to leave as more grown men go in and get in on the action, followed by Joseph Mitchell, who loves to shove kids' heads into the floor. This eight to one student to grown abusive men ratio was how they would break the student to get them to play by their rules and their programming. Some of these kids had just been through situations of rape, abuse, or losing a parent like myself, and this is the kind of treatment they would receive as soon as they arrived at the program. Let's go ahead, shut the door, beat the shit out of this kid some more, and shave his head. After I had signed my inventory sheet, I was led down to the classroom. There was 11 boys sitting down at tables, staring at books. As I walked in, not one looked up from their book. No one even made a move. It was like I was a ghost, and no one even noticed me. I sat down and was handed a rule book and told to read it. I looked up at the kid sitting in front of me and said, What is this place? The staff at the front of the room said, No talking, keep your head down, and read. This is your only warning. I was still a little thrown back by what exactly was going on. Plus, I had no sleep from the night before from traveling with my hired child escorts and being smashed into the floor by four grown men. But I went ahead and put my head down and read. I proceeded to cross my legs to get comfortable and again heard the staff say, Both feet on the floor, sit up, head down, no talking. At this time, you may be thinking, how do programs like this even exist? I'm sure others are thinking, good, you got what you deserve. Either way, it's important to understand that these programs are just a small part of a bigger operating system. Here's a letter from George Bush to Jason Finlinson. In order to see this, we must trace our way back. Jason Finlinson was the director at Academy at Ivy Ridge. The property in Ogdensburg, New York was purchased by Robert Litchfield for around $50,000, not too shabby of a price for a full college university and 200 acres of land. Robert then leased the property to Jason Finlinson, who happened to be his son-in-law. Robert's brother Narvin also got a piece of the pie with his own facility to run, Casa by the Sea. We also have Robert W. Litchfield, who took on Teen Mentor, Robert Litchfield's son. This is a very lucrative business that capitalizes on troubled teens. It's really quite the perfect scheme. If any kids call foul play, they'd simply dismiss it as a lying rebellious teen. Family reps, which we'll get into more later, were thoroughly trained on how to speak and educate parents. One of their famous lines were, We will only believe half about what they say about you if you only believe half of what they say about us. Also, for parents, there is no such thing as money issues, and that they have failed at adequately educating the parents on the need and value of the program completion. See, these people didn't physically and mentally abuse people's children for free. It came with a great cost. Let's just do some basic math. The price per student per month ranged from $3,700 to $5,600. So let's say we have 500 students at $5,000 a month. That would be $2.5 million. $30 million a year. And that's just a single facility. I personally know that most staff at the Academy at Ivy Ridge made $6.50 an hour because they always complained they didn't get paid enough money and even wrote $6.50 on their name badge as some type of immature protest to Jason Finlinson. 
This picture sent to Jason Finlinson by George Bush and his first lad may make more sense once you understand that Robert Litchfield donated over $1 million during the 2002 and 2004 election. Let's briefly look at other directors of other facilities to see what type of qualifications Robert Litchfield was seeking. Litchfield has no background in child psychology, his former job being a staff member at Provo Cannon Boys School. Provo Cannon School was owned and operated by Universal Health Services. Universal Health Services is one of the largest and most respected providers of hospital and health care services in the nation with nearly 90,000 employees dedicated to improving people's lives. Quite the start for Robert Litchfield. Academy has no permit from Education Ministry. Not sure they needed it. Academy overcrowded. Is that a concern? Uh, my own concern easily resolved. Inadequate food and meal portions, would that raise a concern? Mild concern. Some punishments qualify as physical and psychological abuse. Does that raise concerns? That would be a concern if it was accurate. And what was your field of study? Business. Did you ever take any psychology classes? You know, I think I did, but I couldn't swear to that. Maybe just like Psychology 101, yeah, General just, Ed? Just basic stuff, yeah. Okay. Ken Kay, President and Public Voice of WASP. He started as a night staff at Brightway Adolescent Hospital in St. George, Utah. He served as a director until it was shut down in 1998. Kay currently serves as a superintendent of Browning Distance Learning Academy, a homeschool curriculum company owned by Robert Litchfield. And what was your field of study? Business. Kay also said in August 2004 during his testimony in the WASP vs. Pure case that in his opinion, Sexual activity between staff members and students is not necessarily abuse. J.K., the son of Ken K., got his start in WASP working for his father as a security guard at Brightway Adolescent Hospital. He has admitted to pepper spraying students repeatedly. Car Fransworth. Fransworth met Robert Litchfield when they both worked at Provo Cannon Schools. Ron Garrett, serving as administrator directly under Ken K, Ron Garrett was the face of cruelty in Cross Creek Manor. He participated in the torture and deliberate emotional distress of all students. He ordered the restraints, food and sleep deprivation, and bragged about keeping students in isolation for more than six months at a time. Narvin Litchfield has a long and checkered history with WASP, the brother of Robert Litchfield. He got his start in 1998 when he opened Carolina Springs Academy. He then went on to open, concurrently with the CSA, the Academy at Dundee Ranch in Costa Rica. In 2003, Dundee Ranch was shut down by Costa Rican child welfare authorities due to the allegations that children were being held against their will. Officials also found that 100 of the 193 students did not have the required immigration papers. He was arrested and charged with abuse and violations of the international law. Ben Train, director at Midwest Academy and facilitator for Midwest Academy seminars. He was eventually arrested and charged with sexual assault of a minor, sexual exploitation of a minor by a counselor, and child endangerment. He was found guilty of all charges. Randall Hinton. Jack of all trades for WASP. He started working at Brightway in 1992. He was moved to Cross Creek in 1995. He then served as assistant director for Spring Creek in 1996. Then took a job in the same role for Tranquility Bay in 1997. He was arrested on charges of child abuse by authorities in 2007 and the school was shut down in 2008. He was convicted in 2007 of one count of each third degree assault and false imprisonment. He spent just 25 days in jail. He certainly tested me every day. And he was pepper sprayed by myself, by JK. I think we were the only two that could actually pepper spray a student. I think I can remember Carrie Lane being pepper sprayed more than once. 
in a day. I know he was pepper sprayed more than two times a day. I don't think it would have been more than three times. I would say I received as much abuse as he did as a staff, but that's what we're getting paid to do. Robert W. Litchfield, the son of Robert Browning Litchfield. Officials who visited his facility said that physical, psychological, and verbal mistreatment were apparent. Dace Golding, owner of Casa by the Sea and co-owner of High Impact. Golding, along with old high school buddy Rich Darrington, opened another program called Darrington Academy in Blue Ridge, Georgia, which was closed and criminal charges were pressed against Rich for assault and battery of a minor. Jason Finlayson first became involved with WASP when he served as director of Casa by the Sea. He was known for his harsh, strict, disciplinary style. He was responsible for running a brutal program that systematically abused, deprived, and tormented children. He has been accused of rape of a teenage girl and on countless incidents of assault and battery. Jade Robinson As administrator of both the girls and boys side of Casa by the Sea, Robinson was in charge during the time period of several reported cases of abuse and maltreatment of the students of CBS including violent restraints, rape, and other forms of sexual abuse. Luke Hollows, Administrator, Casa by the Sea. He has been reported to have participated in, ordered, endorsed, excused, and covered up multiple incidents of abuse. Miguel Rodriguez, Co-owner and Director of High Impact. He is an accused rapist and a very violent individual. He is also the mastermind behind the infamous dog cages and the man who would sit on the top of kids as they were being restrained in painful arm leg locks and stress positions. Then we have Brian who owned and ran one of the most notorious WASP programs, Paradise Cove, a facility where children were subject to miserable conditions, denied proper food and medical care, and systematically tortured, assaulted, neglected, and broken. We have Dwayne Lee, director of Paradise Cove until the facility closed in 2002. Richard Darrington who partnered with Dace Golding to open Darrington Academy in 2004, the same year Casa by the Sea closed. In 2009, they were charged with battery on two students at the school. Wayne Winder became director of Majestic Ranch in 2001. In 2002, he was arrested and charged with sexual, assaulting one girl, assaulting one boy, and threatening to kill another. He was also charged with showing a boy pornography and three misdemeanor counts of child abuse. Majestic Ranch treated children from 7 to 14. J. Ralph Atkin, the owner of SkyWest Airlines, EuroSky Airlines, and Jet Acquisitions Group, also a trustee of WASP, has an office in St. George, Utah, and is a Mormon. He was also apparently WASP main legal counsel, serving as registered agent for many WASP entities. In fact, in legal corporate documents and filings, his name is second only to WASP itself in a number of appearances. In order to shield WASP, he relied on tactics such as shell companies, misspelling of names and addresses, and name changes. We also have Steve and Glenda Roach from St. George, Utah, where they both worked as police officers. They started by an all-girls program called Sunrise Beach in Cancun, Mexico. It was closed in 1996 by Mexican authorities and the Roaches were arrested on charges of illegally detaining children and depriving them of their rights. It amazes me that these men thought that they could physically and mentally abuse children like me and get away with it. It's quite obvious they weren't very good at looking into the future to see that the very ones they abused would be the ones later they would have to answer to. Word of advice for anyone with children in their care. Remember, these kids will grow up and you never know who they might become. So you know, I get messages every day from 30 year old, 40 year old women and men, former servicemen, countrymen, patriots, and they message me all the time asking how to cope with this pain from these facilities that you inflicted on them. I hope you know this. As I sat in the classroom and stared at the rule book, I saw a rule for everything. And for every rule, there was a specific consequence. No communicating, no talking, no nonverbal communication, no hand gestures, no facial expressions, no note passing, stare at your school book, no looking up, no crossing of legs, no slouching, back off the chair, walk in line in sync with the student in front of you, no further than an arm's length apart. No looking out of line. Stare at the head in front of you. The list went on and on. After what felt like hours of sitting there staring at the rule book, 
I hear the guy at the front of the room yell, Line up! Everyone stood up, pushed in their chairs, and proceeded to form a line. Once everyone was in line, we counted off. One, two, three, four, and so on. We proceeded down the hallway to the bathroom, escorted by the staff. We had something like one minute to use the bathroom, one at a time, as the rest of the students would stand in line formation, at attention, staring at the head in front of him. If we took too long in the bathroom, it was a consequence. Every single move we made was controlled and critiqued. The program was made up of levels, level 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Each day, you were able to earn a certain amount of points, or merits. At the end of each day, we would rate ourselves on our behavior, attitude, hygiene, and how we treated the staff and the other students. You could earn approximately 12 points or merits a day. However, it was the staff who would oversee your rating of yourself and approve or deny it. If they didn't approve of your rating, they would hand you a consequence for misinformation. All consequences equaled a certain amount of demerits or point deductions, and these consequences were handed out every day, all day. There was a category 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, 5 being the highest and resulting in observational placement. You would need to obtain so many points or merits to move to the next level. Not only would you need the points, you would also need approval from all students, staff, and administration. You have to remember this is a business. It's about money. The longer you stayed in the program, the more money they would make. They had certain staff named family representatives who were the ones who would communicate information between the student and the parents. Family reps had incentive programs and were trained to keep the children in the program as long as possible, while coaching the parents into understandings of setbacks which resulted in level drops adding months of time to the student's stay. Students were able to write one letter a week to their parents, which was proofread by staff and family representatives. Any signs or hints of abuse or mistreatment and the letters would never go out and you would earn yourself a consequence for manipulation. Letters that came into the program from parents were also screened. It was common to get a letter that had black sharpie blacking out several sentences. Like in any controlling cult practice, we were required to write a confession letter to our parents once we got there. This would ease any parent's concern whether or not they made the right choice in sending their kids to the program. In the letter, we would confess that we were basically horrible kids and would manipulate our parents constantly. We had to also confess to anything we had done, and if what we wrote wasn't condemning enough, they would rip up the letter, hand us a consequence for unsatisfactory, and make us start over. To see what's happening here, it's important to understand how cults and mind control operate. Cults often use behavior modification on followers, such as thought-stopping techniques and instilling an us-versus-them mindset. With thought-stopping techniques, members are taught to stop doubts from entering their consciousness about the cult, often with a key phrase they repeat. Once a target has been identified, cult members deploy a variety of tactics to establish power over the individual. These mental manipulation tactics include techniques like love bombing, inciting paranoia about the outside world, and public humiliation. Cults isolate followers by controlling their personal relationships and by restricting information sources to the cult. The lack of alternative information and true havens undermine a follower's cognitive process on matters regarding the group. The cult can now do the thinking for them. The essence of brainwashing. Cultic behaviors and rituals can have a devastating effect on the brain and people's lives often taking advantage of vulnerable people in search of comfort and identity. They disable critical thinking process and freeze emotional process to both gain and maintain control over their members. Robert Litchfield, along with many other program directors, were from Utah and were practicing Mormons. Religion in general can be quite the mind control operation, and the process used is very similar to the way this program was ran. First you give them an end goal, like heaven, or in our case, completing the program and going home. Then they explain that you are guilty by showing you the behaviors you should feel guilty for. They'll make you feel bad for your actions and things you have done and how those actions won't get you to your desired end goal. 
Then they pry you for a confession, verbally, or in this case, a written confession letter. They point out all the things in your life that you should be sorry for and make you confess to them and make you scared to repeat these behaviors again under the threat of a horrible consequence, like eternal hell or never graduating the program. They also need to isolate you from anyone else who is not in the program or in their cult. They'll cut you off from the world or any friends that are a part of the world and isolate you. They set you apart. Here, they're basically cutting out any type of external inputs or reasoning that would go against their control programming. If you should ever question their authority, rules, or method, they would shun and reject you publicly and call you a manipulator, insubordinate, sinner, retrobate, or outcast. They would also encourage others in the cult to do the same. Having cut you off from themselves and others within the cult, you would have already been distanced from the world, isolated, and left with feelings of condemnation, fearful of that dreaded consequence, eternal hell, or never completing the program and reaching your final prized reward. Now your only hope for completion would be to go back and start the process over again by confessing you were wrong and working their program and being under their control. Once again, their objective is to break your spirit and leave you feeling guilty, separated from the world, terrified of hell, and dedicated to being submissive to their control system. Mind control works on the majority, but it's the people with good intentions that usually have the greatest impact when they are sucked in. Once programmed, deprogramming can be very difficult or next to impossible. When you see a system pumping constant fear, control, isolation, and public shaming, you should understand you are in the midst of a mind control brainwashing operation. And when I say mind control, I'm also referring to behavioral modification. If they can control your mind, they will likewise control your behavior. After I was forced to write my confession letter, easing my mother's conscience about sending her son to a program, the family representatives would prompt the parent to write a commitment letter. This was a letter the parents would write to their child that would let the child know that they were committed to them completing the program at all cost. Family reps were trained to call the parent daily until they obtained the commitment letter. They would later use this commitment letter against the parent if the parents were suffering from financial issues and thinking about pulling the child out of the program. What kind of message would you be sending your child if they aren't expected to complete the program in light of your commitment letter to them? Once the student received the commitment letter, they then understood the only way out of the program was to conform and play by the programming rules. Let me give you a few examples of how these rules and consequences were enforced by the staff that worked there. You have to keep in mind these guys worked three days on, two days off, made $6.50 an hour, and sat in a quiet room staring at a bunch of kids staring at books. This was before smartphones came out. They really couldn't help but stir things up. They would say something like, Dave. Dave would look up and say, yes. And they would say, come pick up two consequences for being off task and speaking without permission. You're off task because you looked off your book and just because I called your name does not mean you have permission to speak. Dave would stand up and pick up two consequences, which he would need to fill out why exactly he is accountable for his behavior. The consequences needed to be filled out with every single line used, and it had to be 100% sincere, or you'd just get more consequences. An example would be, I am accountable for being off task. I chose to look off my book and to be off task when I heard my name called, and chose to look up from my studies. Next time, I will keep my attention focused on my studies and not be off task from noises and sounds I hear around me. I will keep my focus on my school book as that is what is important. I am accountable for speaking without permission. 
When I heard my name called, I assumed I had been given permission to speak and said yes. In the future, I will correct myself by remaining quiet until I am given permission to speak verbally by the staff. Again, if the staff didn't like what you wrote, you just end up with another consequence, and so on. And when you went to hand in the completed consequence to the staff, you'd want to have a smile on your face, or they would give you another consequence for unsatisfactory attitude. They would literally do this until they got the reaction they were looking for. They would do everything in their power to reach your breaking point. Break you down and then put you down. And that's where observational placement would come in. OP was a small room where you were forced to lay on your stomach with your chin on the floor for days, weeks, and even months. Any move and you would be handled. There was a kid there who truly wasn't mentally stable to be in a regular school. In common terms, people would describe him as someone who had special needs. And he was a constant target. I felt so bad for this kid and can only imagine his mental state today. We would only be lined up to go to the bathroom every two and a half hours. This kid would have to pee or crap so bad you could see him out of the corner of your eye just squirming. He would raise his hand and the staff would call his name. He would say, I need to use the bathroom. The staff would start their game. Come get a consequence. I didn't give you permission to talk. As he would approach the staff, bursting at the seams, he'd be raising his hand again, trying to get permission to talk, and the staff would literally ignore him. Long story short, they'd make this kid piss and shit in his pants, which was considered a Cat 5 self-infliction and resulted in observational placement. This kid literally spent months in OP. You could see this kid's chin bone, which eventually turned into a scab when he finally got out. This kid was so nervous that he couldn't stop picking at his chin where the scab was, resulting in another self-infliction and more OP time. It was a constant cycle. Once you were let out of OP, you would go to the next room over called worksheets. In worksheets, you would sit in a chair with the rule book in your lap and copy the rule book word from word all day long, sometimes for days, weeks, or months. While in worksheets, every two hours, you would have something they called fitness. Again, they weren't only mentally breaking you down, but also physically breaking you down. If you were unable to complete the fitness, you would land yourself back in OP. Let's say they were doing something like six inches. While you lie on your back and you have to keep your feet off the ground until they finish counting to whatever number they chose. If a kid were to drop his feet, they would make everyone start over. And this would go on and on and on. What seemed to be abnormal and abusive when I first arrived had turned into the new normal. It happened every day, all day. This is a perfect example of the results of conditioning. Look at this student on the couch as a kid is slammed to the floor right in front of him. Completely normal. Once he made it out of OP and through worksheets and back to the classroom where you would stare at your book all day, it seemed the only choice you had was to work the program. Or in better terms, let the program work you. The more you played by their rules, the quicker you could get out. A normal day routine started by the yelling of wake up, followed by a 10 second countdown to be out of your bed and in your correct position in line and count off. Then you would be led to morning fitness. After fitness, you would go back upstairs to make your bed, get in your uniform. There were usually three people to each room, two on a bunk and one on the floor. There were very strict rules on how you kept everything organized in your room and how you folded your socks to even folding your dirty clothes and underwear. If your roommate failed to roll his socks the proper way or had a messy unfolded dirty clothes basket, you would earn yourself a consequence for their actions. Showers were quick, two minutes, in and out, use the bathroom and get back in line. All this was done in silence. We would then head to the cafeteria for breakfast, which was usually cereal with water and a piece of bruised rotten fruit. 
They would play the same self-help tape over and over for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. After breakfast, we would be led back to the classroom to sit and wait for group to begin. Group was an hour a day where we would all sit around in a circle with the family rep. Every day, the attention would be focused on someone individually, by the family reps and everyone in the group. We were to talk about our progress in the program. This was also a time where the students were encouraged to give other students feedback, where they would stand up and present their experience of you. This would be the time to get your brownie points, basically, and call out any kinds of behavior that was frowned upon. Even if a kid was innocent, kids would stand up just to talk nonsense about the other. If you didn't participate in group and give feedback, which was basically cutting people down, your family rep would stop you from being voted up to the next level. At the same time, if you cut down too many people through your feedback, your peers would stand up against you when you tried to move up levels. It was an excellent setup. After group, you would sit and stare at your school book for a few hours. You were required to take and pass two to three tests per week with an 80% or greater. And if you didn't, you'd be sent to worksheets for unsatisfactory effort. Lunch was the same deal. We would be led to the cafeteria, would sit in silence listening to the same old self-help program. We were also required to eat 80% of every meal no matter what, or we would receive a refusal consequence. After lunch, back to stare at the school books. Then dinner, same routine. After dinner, more school books, and finally an hour before we head up to sleep, we could either write in a journal or read an approved book. Anything you wrote in your journal was fair game for any staff to read at any time and often were read and consequences would be handed out. We'd then be led upstairs to go to our rooms and sleep. It was very uncomfortable sleeping conditions, especially in the summer. I would lie awake most of the night sweating. There was no air conditioning anywhere within the building and every single window was shut, locked, and had alarms. I often had thoughts of running and even mentioned it to a kid, which ratted me out, and I ended up in OP. The more you told on kids, it seemed the easier it was to get through the program. So I decided to keep my thoughts to myself and just play their game. I finally made it to level three after eight months of being there. At level three, you were allowed a 15 minute phone call with your parents once every other week. This was done in the family rep's office, and they were on the phone call too, sitting directly in front of you, listening to both sides of the call, and watching your every move. I remember the first time I called my mom. There was so much I wanted to say, but I knew I couldn't. I simply told my mom what the family rep wanted to hear. I was not going to jeopardize eight months of working the program just to start over. Here's probably a good time to bring up seminars. A seminar is a multi-day group event in which children are subjected to emotional abuse and brainwashing tactics. Seminars were based heavily in cult recruitment tactics and gulag-like psychological manipulation techniques. They were also the bright and shiny thing that broke up the months of monotony. Imagine, if you will, wearing the same clothes, eating the same food, doing the same schoolwork at the same computers with the same people day after day for months. You are not allowed to talk. You are not allowed to look out the window. You are not allowed to even choose whether or not to eat the food. Surrounding you are always the same gray walls. Instructing you are the same gray teachers, and supervising you are hawk-eyed busybodies with a chip on their shoulder. You must comply, or be forced into solitary confinement. Then, one day, something changes. You hear loud music, so loud you can hear it rooms over. You feel a frenetic energy permeating the typically dreary school. And then you see your fellow schoolmate. She's coming down the stairs from that loud room. She's crying and screaming, kicking wildly while two adults carry her away. What is going on in that room? You hear screaming and a coarse voice yelling over a loudspeaker, but you can't make out what they're saying. Your roommate comes in very late that night and wakes up early in the morning, but she can't tell you what happened. She looks tired, worn out, hunched over, scared. Of what? You remember this day a few months later when they tell you that it's your turn, your first seminar.
The seminars were mind control at the very best. In order to get to different levels in the program, you would need to go through seminars. Seminars were a super secret, three day long brainwashing event that no one was allowed to talk about. If you were to talk about them, you would be dropped. These seminars only came around every three months. There's so much that happened at these seminars, such intense brainwashing. I can make video upon video about these, but they were just so crazy. Same routine, they would break you down, crush your spirit, have you confess to all sorts of things, publicly shame you in front of everyone, cut you down, and then encourage others to bash you all while you just sat there and absorbed it all. The orientation seminar was really just a, a welcoming seminar. It was probably the most low key out of all of them. Um, they introduced you to accountability language, um, which basically me meant that you took fault in positions you put yourself in or in ways that other people experienced you, which was a very clever way of disguising victim blaming. Victim blaming and, and situations that people find themselves in. I uh, was reading some accounts of uh, other people's orientations and it came up that even rape survivors were made to admit that they were accountable for choosing to go through with a rape. For example, uh, someone stands up and says that they had been raped and that was their emotional baggage that they were carrying around. So the facilitator would pinpoint on that. And occasionally they would be name, made to wear a name badge that said that they were a rape victim or that they were someone who used sex as a manipulation tactic. Um, you needed to, of course, tell everyone in the room your story. And you needed to hold yourself accountable and claim accountability to the facilitator and to the rest of the group uh, for being in the position of being alone with someone who could rape you. So you have these very young girls who have been uh, victims of a horrific crime and now they need to stand in front of a bunch of strangers and spill their life story and the worst thing that's ever happened to them and then be blamed for it. So this is already off to a fantastic start and we are on our first seminar. Um, I should probably put a trigger warning at the beginning of this. Um, I'm probably going to do that at the beginning of this podcast. I think uh, that's wise, considering yeah. we just had another suicide in the survivors group a couple of months ago. Um, just as all of this stuff became in the media and became popular and something people talked about, everyone is now getting their memories back and it is resulting in some very unhealthy situations, suicides and overdoses. Yeah, I can imagine a lot of these people have blocked out all of this from their memory because why wouldn't you? This sounds like a, a terrible emotional situation that your brain would actively try to protect you from. Um, yeah, without proper therapy, I can't imagine getting through something like this. Instead of uh, the pizza coming to you, uh, we'll come and pick the pizza up and take it and let it get cooked for a little while. In that type of sense. Until it's ready to come home and then uh, get a brand new hot good pizza. In these seminars, they used everything from death metal music to trance music to strobe lights and other lighting techniques, loudspeakers, closed-eyed hypnotism, anger release methods, death reenactments where we would lay in imaginary coffins, food, water, and sleep deprivation, just some of the most bizarre practices you could put someone through, even role-playing where you would kill other students. So now that we had come to grips with our inner magical child, and we had stripped away the things like our image, we then needed to come to terms with how we felt about ourselves. So in the lifeboat scenario, it's very much like the sinking of the Titanic. There weren't enough lifeboats, there was an accident, so we're all in the seminar room with more flashing lights, screaming, noises of a crash, uh, really making us live through what feels like a boat crash. Right, because you're already so emotionally raw after all of this you'll it's strung out you don't really have a choice but to go through whatever they're throwing at you exactly 
And these people who have told you either that they believe your story, they don't believe your story, or you, and you've heard that how terrible the things that have happened to them in their lives are, you then need to vote if these people are worth saving or if you're worth saving. So we're all presented with a choice and you need to make an immediate decision. Do you choose yourself or do you choose somebody else? Choose yourself or choose somebody else to throw off of the lifeboat? Somebody to die. There was no, but we share some boat. There was no, the door was so big that two of us could fit on it. There was none of that. They did not accept excuses. You either chose someone else to live or you chose yourself to live. Everybody else died. So if you were to choose somebody else, they would of course berate you for making the wrong choice and tell you that for not wanting to save yourself, it meant that you had some inner self-hatred and uh, you really didn't approve of who you were. If you jumped too quickly and said, I am going to save myself, I'm not going to save anybody else, they would experience you as someone who was selfish and someone who didn't care about the outcomes for people anybody else and that was also the wrong answer so you're damned if you do damned if you don't you're damned if you breathe okay so you and i are are sharing a lifeboat and uh you decide that you're going to save yourself um how do you how do you kill me i have to look you in the eye and i have to tell you that you don't matter to me as much as i matter to me and i had to do that for every person that was in the boat as did we all it needed to be eye contact there needed to be an explanation and it needed to be believable or again we wouldn't be experienced as working the program and we'd be kicked out and then put back into isolation once you completed the required seminar you would be able to move up to the next level of course with the approval from your peers staff and administration once you made it to level four you are considered an upper level or a junior staff as junior staff, you would sit at the front of the classroom at the side of the staff and were encouraged to hand out consequences along with the staff. Upper levels even had a weekly quota that they had to meet of how many consequences they had to hand out. If you made it to level four, you were definitely working the program, or at least acting like you were. With the upper levels came more privileges. You were able to go to the bathroom by yourself and could stay after meals to wash dishes. Upper levels were also told to restrain students. This is what brainwashing does. Upper levels would sit and do their schooling in OP, but instead of being on their chin, they would sit in a comfy chair and watch others lay on their chin. If they moved, better believe that upper level better jump on them until the staff from worksheets gets in there to finish it. Our world really is a direct reflection of this upper level, lower level system. Play by their rules and will move you up and give you privileges. Enforce our rules and you will do well. Of course you have good and bad upper levels, but even the good ones still have to follow the orders or they will be dropped. Once you made it to level 5, you were able to attend a seminar with your parents outside of the facility. Mine was in San Diego, California. You would be flown to the seminar with an escort and basically do three days of seminar with your parents. These weren't like the other seminars at the facility, but they were still quite the brainwash. This is where you and your parents would establish an exit plan and also rules for when you would graduate the program. An exit plan was for when you turned 18 and chose to leave the program without graduation. The parents were encouraged to have nothing to do with you and you would simply walk out the doors in Ogdensburg, New York and be on your own with the clothes on your back. At this point in the program, you were so close to graduation, you wouldn't want to say or do anything to jeopardize the 15 months you just spent working the program. Having to start over again wasn't even an option in my mind. So you just play by their rules. However, shortly after the seminar, I was dropped like many others from level 5 back to level 1. 
At this point, I'd figured I'd be in this place until I was 18 and I was going to take my exit plan with a smile on my face. I literally couldn't take it. However, many did stay in the program after 18 and even some to 19 and longer. I'm telling you, brainwashing at its absolute best. I had a segment in this part of the video that was a great example of how brainwashed these kids were. However, it was instantly blocked from all parts of the world. But it showed a private investigator who broke into one of these programs to try and rescue a girl who was 18 and was set to complete the program regardless of how much time it took. The investigator told the girl the school was a fraud and the diploma she was issued was a scam and that she was basically living in a mind-controlled prison. The girl finally agreed to leave with the reporter, but in the meantime the program had called her father and her father told her his love was conditional on her completing the program and he would have nothing to do with her elsewise. The reporter was thrown out and the girl stayed in the program. I will link the video with a timestamp below. I worked my way back up to level 3 and got my bi-weekly 15 minute phone call back with my mom. The past few months I had been knocking out test after test in school and received my fake diploma. Neither my mom or myself knew it was a fake diploma until a year after I got out. But at the time, I could tell my mom was in good spirits thinking I had graduated from a college prep school. I had been telling her in my weekly letters how excited I was to go to college when I graduated the program. I honestly didn't care for college, but I figured any place would be better than this program. I could tell a change in her voice, even though she didn't say she was going to pull me. And I'm sure she was getting heavily manipulated by the family reps. I could just feel something was different. A few weeks went by and one day Jason Finlinson came into the class and told me to go straight to OP. He didn't give me a reason, but again, I had a feeling something was happening. After hours of laying in OP, a staff came down and told me to come with him. I was going home. They drove me two hours to the airport in Syracuse, New York, and told me to get out in the middle of the parking lot. I was free. But I didn't feel free. I want to let everyone know, everyone's personal information is still here. I got records here. From Wasp, doing cities with the city. This place is a big old scam. I want everyone to see this shit. You want to come down here and get your personal files? Come on down. You know where it is, Academy of Ivy Ridge. Augensburg, New York, Highway 37. This is abuse of everyone's personal information. There's birth certificates, personal records, social security numbers. Everything I want to know about you, I can find if I want. But let you know I respect that everyone that was abused in these institutions, WASP, and Mormon sex. Once again, this is Jonas 420. Over and out. I learned a lot from the Academy in Ivy Ridge. I learned how easy it is to blatantly lie and spread false information and advertisement for personal gain to targeted individuals with the purest intentions. I learned the more overwhelming disinformation you spread, the easier it is to avoid any questions. I learned that these controllers play every part of their operation and manipulate all parties involved. I learned how easily people are manipulated when they are in fearful circumstances, especially fearful for their lives and freedom, and how fear itself is used as a control agent. I learned how easily people will conform when they are put in isolated situations where they will lose what they have worked for unless they play by the rules. I learned that people will follow any orders for a paycheck, even if it goes against their own morals and values. I learned how controllers often work with more powerful controllers to clean up and overlook any loose ends they may leave behind. 
I learned and experienced firsthand the operations of mind control techniques and the lasting results they have. I also learned how hard those brainwashing techniques can be to undo once they are programmed into your subconscious. I learned that when these operations are finally put to rest without any repercussions and move on to their next endeavor. I learned that these specialty programs are set up for the ones who go against the bigger operating systems, where detention and summer school simply don't do enough indoctrinating, no matter how many degrees or master programs and silly masonry hats they put on you. I learned that it's the outlaws and the ones who don't play by the program rules that will essentially be the ones who cause the system to collapse.